isang maligayang araw po muli sa lahat ng mga nanonood. At maligayang pagpapatuloy sa ating pag-aaral hinghil sa charcoal drawing. At muli po ay ikinagagalak ko rin batiin ang mga may-ari ng video clips na ginamit para sa online workshop na ito. At ngayong araw na ito, tatalakayin natin ang pangunahing paraan ng pag-drawing sa pamamagitan ng charcoal. At sa pagpapatuloy ng ating online workshop, ay inaanyayahan muna namin kayo na panuuri ng Part 3 ng Draw and Tell video, habang hinahanda nila Andex at Andro ang Part 3 ng Charcoal Drawing na mapapanood ninyo pagkatapos ng Draw and Tell video. Halika, manood muna tayo. In his early teen years, Kai had so far shown himself to be exceptionally gifted and would of course need an appropriately powerful mentor to help continue his education. His parents introduced him to a mysterious old woman named Thea, who agreed to take over his training. It seemed that this woman of unknown origins was much older than she let on, and the essence training she led Kai through unlocked ancient secrets and dark intents, not only of warping the essence of living things in abominable ways, but of reaching into the forces of nature and life itself, pulling it to his will. By the age of 15, Kai was a formidable essentist, second only to his new mentor, where in a final test of his worthiness and power, Thea commanded Kai to kill his parents so as to absorb their powers into his own. Shocked and heartbroken at their son's betrayal, his parents tried to fight back, but they didn't stand a chance. Kara tried to stop the fight, but was thrown aside and pinned under a fallen banister as the fight raged on. In a frenzy, and using all of her strength and will, Kara tried to lift and release herself from the wreckage, but could not. She watched from a distance as her parents were being tortured, and at the height of her desperation, she somehow tapped into a fragment of her own essence. Instinctively, she pulled it outside of her body and gave it a physical form, a long-forgotten act known as essentification. An essentification takes the physical shape as the representation of the inner powers and will of the essentist who summons it, and so Kara's was thin, weak and barely had strength to stand. But with their strength combined, she managed to free herself, but she was too late. Her parents died in front of her, and her brother absorbed their essence into his own, becoming even more powerful. Many of you will have seen something like this around before. This is like a, an artist's pose doll thing, and you can get them from craft shops and art shops. They're little wooden dolls, and you can pose the limbs into different places so that you can use them as an artistic reference to draw a human figure. The reason I'm using this to further illustrate the importance of construction is to show that this is what artists can use as a reference to uh, exemplify something that is in its nature quite detailed and organic and difficult to jump into the details of. So in simplifying it, in having it in several different chunks, we have the arm, upper arm and lower arm and then hand, we have the upper torso, mid torso and then pelvis, all of these chunks uh, represent fairly detailed and difficult to sort of explain on their own forms in the human form. So next to a human figure, obviously, they're quite different. One of them is very simple and very basic and the other is very intricate. We have muscle structures, uh, we have details, but they represent one another in a pretty straightforward way. So this figure, this um, wooden doll, is essentially a construction object that artists can use. It, it helps us simplify the details. So then when we use that uh, method, whether it be through a doll or through sketching, through using simplified methods of application first, we can then move it in ways that are easier for our mind to understand without having the details distracting us. And then once we're happy with the basics and the form that works well for us, we can add detail on top of that. And we can refine silhouette and shape, add texture, line work, color, and all of that. But we begin with the foundation and that Ladies and gentlemen, is what construction is. So I hope that my analogies have proven to make a bit of sense. Now, when you construct, you're essentially working with a deconstructed form of a complicated thing. That may sound a little uh, 
complicated. To further explain what I mean, I'm going to bring down the opacity of my figure here and I'm going to deconstruct this human body. Oh, and for those of you who are interested, I might as well take the opportunity to plug myself. Uh, this figure here is from my anatomy reference and pose pack. So if you're interested in checking out uh, the male and female figure of this person and a, and a woman in loads of different poses with weapons and with uh, isolated body parts with muscle structures pointed out and all of that, make sure to click the link on the screen and in the description to go check out the anatomy reference and pose pack on the Jazza Studios shop. So as I was saying, to construct something from simplicity, we need to know how it's deconstructed. So the human form, there are lots of different ways that you can essentially have the, the deconstructed version of the human form. But the most common sort of thing to do is to take very large sections, the most uh, obvious sections like the, the head, like this, and break it down into a basic shape. Then we have the torso. The torso is an interesting thing because we have the abdominal area which is sort of like an accordion. We have the top and the bottom of an accordion. If you can imagine the upper torso being the top of the accordion and the pelvis being the bottom of the accordion, the abdominal section is like that springy bit that moves around and the abdominal muscles move the, this is my little dance for you, move the, uh, the torso and the pelvis around. Uh, so they're very flexible. So it's important to uh, separate these three areas. We have the upper body, and I usually shape the construction line something like this because it sort of exemplifies the rib cage. Then we have the accordion section and then we have the torso. Now I'm not drawing in a solid section for the abdominals. You can do so if you want to. You can sort of sketch it in or you can sketch just a line for the center point of the body, perhaps even where the spine is. But because it's a very flexible area, it's not important to focus on this section. What's most important is this rib cage section and the torso and hip section because they're quite large and they take up a lot of mass. This idea follows on throughout the rest of the body really. So the shoulder is another one of those sections that's usually a bit larger and you can sort of uh, symbolize that with a bit of a circle. The hand I like to usually do in a bit of a block section. And then the arms are something that you can sort of do in whatever way works well for you. Sometimes people like to do sort of like a joint in the middle and do lines joining from the shoulder to the fore, to the wrist uh, and then to fill that in with the muscle mass. Sometimes it works for people to simply draw in the muscles directly sort of having a rough idea as to how it would work anyway, but you know, whichever works for you to each their own. The neck again is one of those things that because it moves around so much, it's one of those accordion sections. Uh, we don't necessarily have to have the solidity drawn in there in our construction, but we can if we want. If we do, we essentially want to make sure that we outline the thickness of the neck and then make sure to sort of roughly indicate the neck muscles that stretch out towards the shoulders. Then going into the legs, similar sort of thing. We have the knee area. I usually like to block out the knee in a circular shape like that. Do the feet as sort of blocky pads. And again, as with the arms, you can simply have lines that you fill in the muscle mass with later, or you can just simply draw in the mass areas. And as you get a feel for how the anatomy sort of works with each other, how the muscles flow and how the silhouettes work on different angles, that becomes more simple. So it might be easier to start off with the lines and then add muscle mass with references, or just to work straight with muscle masses if you are familiar with how the human muscle mass works. Another thing that's important to note is with the face and torso, we usually have these things called direction lines. So if I hide the body, you can see that this face that I've got here isn't much of a face, but we have a center line and an eye line. We'll get to that in further detail later because we'll go into the head in more detail later. But as you can see, if I zoom out, I've got the human figure that we were just looking at deconstructed. Now, why is this important to know? Because with a deconstructed figure into basic shapes like this, we can then use that as a template, as a guide, to use that deconstructed form and then reshape it, move the body around, put it in different poses, and then from there add refinement. This is useful in several ways. One is that we're not investing a huge amount of time and effort to strenuously add detail and muscle anatomy and all this stuff to figure out only that the pose doesn't work or that we've got the proportions wrong. But if we draw it in the basic shapes first and when we figure it around, we can realize that if things aren't working, we can remove or reshape or completely start again without losing much of the time that we invested in creating the deconstructed figure. So as an example, I'm gonna move my deconstructed figure over here and move all my examples 
over here, and I'm gonna sketch up two roughly constructed poses using my deconstructed figure. Now even construction figures can end up looking quite intricate, so it's important to start off with a very bare bones. And sometimes it's easiest, especially if we're doing a tricky pose, to start off with a wireframe figure, meaning only the solid objects of the head, torso, and pelvis being used with just basic lines and little joint circles to communicate where the bones and limbs are positioned. Once you've got the basic wireframe pose in, you can then start doing what I like to call adding meat onto the bones, which is where we sort of start to roughly outline the silhouettes of where the muscles connect to each other and where the masses are larger for example in the tricep and bicep, on the upper arm, in the abdominal regions, in the torso, and so on and so forth. Finally, after the silhouette is solidified, I can start to add in some placeholder details just of where certain things might be, and then also add some nip and tucks and tweaks. And then finally, and then the result is a framework on which I can then go forward and do some sketching and final details and line work. I'm gonna repeat the process again with another pose, this time crouching low and with a bit of a different angle, facing slightly more to the front, but still off to the side. And using really basic shapes and structures, I'm able to create poses on any angle or with any complexity and make simple adjustments quickly and easily without compromising the time that I've put in, which is quite minimal because we're focusing on what matters most before we add the detail. You can see how quickly and easily by using these basic shape structures and construction lines, I'm able to put together whatever pose I want to or can improvise through the process without it being much of a hassle and then have something that is going to serve as a pretty solid foundation on which I can then sketch, add line work and have a finished result.